It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope all of you are doing well. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you'll get in touch and give me a call or send an email. Please also remember that we are continuing to get together every Lord's Day morning at 9 o'clock a.m. And so if that 9 o'clock service fills up, we're also replaying the 9 o'clock service at 10.30 a.m. at the church building using the projector. But if you could use the Sign Up Genius account, it really helps. If you need any help signing up, if you have any trouble with that, get in touch with either me or with Kenna. And if you're listening by phone and need any help with this, or if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I certainly hope that you will give me a call at 608-224-0274. In terms of good news, I want to give you a bit of an update tonight. Last week, I had just dragged the desk out of my office, and since our class last week, I have salvaged an incredibly solid desktop from Goodwill. The whole desk was $9.99, and I took that, removed the top, took off the pieces, did some recycling, and I've now installed a standing desk by uh, putting that old desktop on top of my bookshelves. And so right now I'm standing at that standing desk, uh, recording tonight's class. I also disassembled my old desk and recycled some of the drawers as something of a side table. You can see that to the left of the chair there in the picture. And I'm still looking for a better chair, just kind of playing around with this, not sure where this will lead, but a lot has been accomplished in my office. A lot of cleaning has been done, a lot of organizing, and I'm just maybe not even halfway there, but a lot of good has been done down here in my office over the last week. You may remember I had been using a sheet as a background for our class last week, going back, of course, the wood pile before that, but now that I'm inside, I needed something that could easily be pulled up and out of the way, and so the sheet was a little bit difficult, and so I went looking on Facebook and kind of had some possibilities out there and ended up finding a bamboo shade on Facebook Marketplace, and this is uh, what is behind me tonight. After class, I can pull the cord and it goes back up to the ceiling, and so I can reclaim my office after having a background there for recording the videos. As I was kind of playing with this, I noticed something a little bit weird with the colors on the video in the background there. I don't know if you'll be able to see this on the small uh, image of me there. I don't know if it's a lighting issue or whether there's anything we can do about it. Maybe it's a camera issue, but uh, the light seems to be splitting in a couple different colors there. But uh, anyway, I don't know where this will head. I may end up painting that black. I'm not sure where that'll go, but I'm just saying it's a work in progress down here. We appreciate your patience here. Uh, tonight we also hope to have Aaron Grodi, one of our shepherds, lead a prayer at the end of class. This was a first attempt. I would emphasize that. And we have learned quite a bit over the past 24 hours, but it was a good first step, I think, assuming that this works. And uh, he texted the video. Of course, uh, that makes it highly compressed. And I uh, asked my son for help with that and uh, getting it in a format that I could just drag and drop into PowerPoint. That's at least the way I could figure to do this in some way that might work. And uh, my son looked at it and he said, oh, I see this is uh, potato quality. And I said, what do you mean by potato quality? What in the world? And he said, it looks like it was produced by a potato. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a kick out of that. I think going back to the old batteries, uh, using a potato or whatever, some primitive technology here. Uh, but again, we thank Aaron for making a good first stab at this and giving it a good shot. And we'll see if it works tonight and we'll work on improving it from here. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a heads up there. I would also note that we've had some issues with the phone over the past few weeks. Those of you who join us on the phone, I know that you've had some issues with some choppiness and cutting in and out and probably due to some slow internet with the uh, service going out on the internet via video uh, on YouTube and then simultaneously going out over the phone line which is uh, through a computer and all that so those things are kind of uh, bogging down the system over there a little bit but we are working on it we do have some possibilities that we can go to here but uh, thank you so much to those of you who let us know about those issues we appreciate the feedback that helps us to uh, fix the problems that we're having Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke, and by way of review, in case you might be joining us for the first time, I know we've been here for a number of months now in this study, but some of you could be here for the first time. Just by way of review, we know Luke is a Gentile. Uh, he may be the only author of the New Testament who is not uh, from a Jewish background, so that's unique about Luke. He's a Gentile. He's a medical doctor. That also makes Luke very unique among the authors of the Bible. He writes Luke and Acts. Volume 1, Volume 2, The Life of Christ, The Growth of the Early Church, both of these books are addressed to a man by the name of Theophilus. Luke makes a point of writing in chronological order. It is a well-researched account talking to eyewitnesses, 
uh, getting their testimony, putting that in writing. And he also includes a number of people and people groups in the uh, New Testament times who were often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world. Widows and widows, or widows and women, Gentiles, Samaritans, as well as the sick and the poor, a number of others. Uh, once again, the Harmony of the Gospels is very helpful in our study tonight. We're dealing with the crucifixion today. Uh, these are available on Amazon for around 25 bucks. Last week we made it halfway through the Lord's crucifixion. We saw Jesus move from the Praetorium to the place of the skull, also referred to as Golgotha or Calvary as we discussed. Uh, Simon of Cyrene is pressed into service to carry the cross and Jesus is nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock on Friday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, people are mocking him, insulting him the whole time, including the thieves on each side who are insulting him simultaneously. But of course, as the morning wears on, one of these men has a change of heart and says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Several days ago, one of our members pointed out in the comments online at the very, um, at the end of that, that uh, this is one of his favorite verses. The idea that this man could be saved right at the very end of his life and would be with Jesus within just a few hours of that statement being made. And I would agree, that is an absolutely amazing statement and certainly a testimony to the amazing grace of God. At the end of our study last week, at some point before noon on Friday, probably right after the soldiers cast their lots for Jesus' garments, uh, the uh, inner garment, the tunic, which was one piece, they didn't want to cut that into pieces to uh, diminish its value, uh, right after they cast lots or gamble for that, uh, Jesus arranges for John, the disciple whom Jesus loves, to take care of his mother, Mary. And that's kind of where we ended last week. Tonight we pick up with what happens at noon. So last week we looked from 9 a.m. to noon. Today we pick up at noon. And so we are halfway through the crucifixion at this point. We pick up with Luke 23, verse 44. So let's look together tonight at Luke 23, and we'll start with verses 44 through 49. Luke 23, 44 through 49. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured. And the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three tell us that we are now at about the sixth hour of this day. And the footnotes explain that this is noon, basically six hours from the sunrise. So. Uh, Jesus is nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. He's now been on the cross for three hours. Matthew, Mark, and Luke also tell us that darkness falls over the land at noon from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, and so from noon until 3 p.m. on that Friday. The sun is obscured, as Luke describes it. If we were together, I would ask why. Why does this happen? What is the point of this? Why does God bring in darkness for the last three hours of the crucifixion? Well, we aren't told. But we might imagine that this is a picture of how terrible this is. This is absolutely the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of this world. Or perhaps some have speculated that God is almost protecting his son from some of the public embarrassment of this. This is his way of, of either turning away or perhaps shielding his son from some of the public ridicule. We, we don't really know the answer to that, but it's interesting and something that sometimes we may miss when we study the crucifixion, this uh, three hours of darkness in the last half of it. But I also don't know whether we really appreciate the impact that this darkness would have had. Maybe we could imagine being the Roman centurion in charge of this. This man has probably uh, coordinated the execution, the crucifixion of many people at this point in his life. 
and maybe we could imagine being this man and, and it takes place on this major religious holy day thousands upon thousands of people from all around the world have come together to the city of Jerusalem for this Passover celebration uh, Jesus is arrested in the middle of the night he's sentenced to death within the span of just a few hours there are accusations floating around out there that this man is the son of God that he is another king and so tensions are high things are being said and then here we are halfway through this process and everything immediately goes dark if you are the crucifix if you are the centurion in charge of this crucifixion and you are surrounded by thousands upon thousands of people and if you're crucifying three men and all of a sudden the sun goes dark and everything around you is now pitch black, what is your first concern? Well, I'm imagining that this man would be calling for light. I'm imagining that there would be a, a mad scramble for uh, torches of some kind. That's probably not something they planned on during this day when they set out that morning. And I would imagine that we could hardly imagine the chaos of this event at noon when darkness suddenly falls upon the land. And uh, personally, I'm thinking that most people would be asking themselves, what in the world is going on here? This is unusual. This is supernatural. Something extremely strange is happening here. So it would focus people's attention. Maybe that's another reason for this. At this point, though, Matthew and Mark both fast forward to the ninth hour. And so we go immediately from noon until three. We basically have no record of anything happening in those three hours. We kind of pick up at three. So the world goes dark at noon and at three we pick back up and they tell us that Jesus cries out Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani which translated means my God my God why have you forsaken me and this is of course a direct quote from Psalm 22 verse 1 and in a time when they didn't have the Bible divided into chapters and verses this was often how rabbis would tell people to turn to a certain passage I know at our congregation, when we had pew Bibles in the pews before the uh, pandemic, we would often say, turn with me to page number 500 or whatever, or turn to Psalm number 22. Well, if they couldn't do that, they would often just quote the opening line, and that would be their way of saying, turn with me to this passage. And people would remember the opening lines of those passages and of those psalms. And so with this, it seems that Jesus is perhaps directing people to Psalm number 22, which is just an amazing prophecy of the crucifixion. If anybody was paying attention, this is what they would, would note from this. Well, many people in the crowd, though, completely misunderstand. And people from all over the world, we've got different languages going on here. And, and many people think that he's calling out for Elijah. And I know we look at this, we see the similarity. It sounds like Elijah. And Matthew and Mark tell us that uh, at this point, somebody runs and fills a sponge with sour wine. So maybe it was a matter of his speech being garbled because he was thirsty. And so they put this sour wine on a, on a reed, on a sponge, and they give Jesus a drink. And Jesus accepts it this time. He takes a drink of it. Uh, John tells us that this was mixed with hyssop. Uh, earlier, it was wine mixed with myrrh or gall which was considered something of a, of a painkiller, almost like a, a narcotic, uh, as we would say today, something to take the edge off. And you may remember that Jesus turned that away earlier. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. But now that it's just the sour wine, he accepts it in order to quench his thirst. And the crowd is now wondering whether Elijah would come and take him down from the cross. Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus cries out again, this time with a loud voice, and he yields up his spirit and breathes his last. John tells us what he said. This is not recorded in the other accounts. It is finished, he says over in John. Luke tells us that he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that's a quote from Psalm 31, verse 5. And it's almost it almost seems like a deliberate act, like this is it. I'm, I'm giving up my spirit. This is the end of this process. And I think that would emphasize him giving up his life willingly. He did this uh, on purpose for us. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that at the moment of the Lord's death, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Matthew and Mark both tell us that it was torn in two from top to bottom. And again, we might discuss why is that little detail significant? Why is that included here? Well, if a person had torn the veil of the temple in two, it would have been torn from bottom to top. But being torn from top to bottom seems to indicate that God is the one who did this. This is a supernatural event. And I wonder, how do we know this? How do these Bible writers know that it was torn not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom? Well, certainly it's inspired, and so God, since he did this, knew this. He would have told them about it. But I'm also wondering whether somebody was in the temple and saw it happen. On a major holiday like this, chances are there were some priests in the temple who witnessed this. And I'm also wondering whether this ultimately convinced some of them to obey the gospel several weeks later on the day of Pentecost. And perhaps that's why we have this little detail recorded for us, because that's what did it for some of these men. Uh, we also have the significance of this. The veil separated the holy place where the priests could go on a regular basis from the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was normally kept. And they could only go in there once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people. And so Jesus' death then opened that up and opened up full access to God. And we read about that, of course, in the book of Hebrews. Through him, we have access to the Father. And that seems to have happened at this point, just at the moment of his death, which is very interesting. Matthew also tells us that an earthquake takes place at the time of Jesus' death and that the tombs are opened and that a number of saints or holy ones who had been dead were raised from the dead at this time. Matthew tells us that they come out of their graves after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. So there's some discussion on the timing of this, but it happens at some point over this weekend. But back to what happens at 3 p.m. As Jesus dies, Luke tells us, that when the centurion sees what has happened, he begins saying, certainly this man was innocent. And again, this is not a one-time statement, but it, I can almost see him walking around saying this over and over again with his hands on his head. Oh no, this I, I've crucified an innocent man. Uh, Matthew tells us that this man is frightened, and we certainly understand why if he's just crucified an innocent man. Uh, Matthew and Mark both tell us that he said, truly this man was the Son of God, which is especially interesting coming from a pagan Roman. Imagine what must be going through your mind if you just coordinated the execution of a man you now believe to be innocent. Mark explains that he came to this conclusion when he saw the way that he breathed his last. In other words, this man had probably seen quite a few people die in his lifetime. And yet here, clearly, the way Jesus died was different. Uh, different enough to convince him that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, an innocent man. I would also emphasize that Luke especially wants his audience of Greeks to identify with the Roman centurion here. This man is a man like us. He's not Jewish. He's Gentile like those of us who are reading this book. And so this man is not biased toward all things Jewish, just the opposite. Uh, this man is a trustworthy witness. He is not likely to be deceived by some kind of religious fraud or deceiver. But a centurion here, a Roman army officer, testifies that Jesus was an innocent man. Luke tells us that the crowds began beating their breasts. That's an indication of sorrow or great stress or mourning. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all remind us that the women who follow Jesus are still standing at a distance observing all of this. Uh, Matthew and Mark actually name a number of the women, including a number of the Marys, and they point out that many women had come with Jesus to Jerusalem. And so not just a few, but there were just a huge crowd of women came to Jerusalem. In John's account now, the Jewish leaders approach Pilate asking that the men's legs be broken so that they will just go ahead and die so they can take them down before sunset since this is a holy day. And again, this is amazing to me. They've just murdered the Son of God. What are they worried about? They're worried about the timing of this. They're worried about getting this dirty deed done before a holy day. They wanted to get that out of the way so they were not unclean. We need to remember that the cause of death by crucifixion was often suffocation. 
as the person had to push up to exhale. And so you could inhale but couldn't exhale because the weight of your body was hanging on the arms. Well, to breathe, to exhale, you'd have to push up with the legs or pull up with the arms, and breaking the legs uh, made that pretty much impossible, and the person would die rather quickly, as opposed to this dragging on for days, as it sometimes did. Well, the soldiers come out, uh, they break the legs of the first man, but when they come to Jesus, they see that he's already dead. And so there's no need to break his legs. So they don't break his legs, but they pierce his side with a spear in order to confirm the death. And immediately blood and water uh, come out. John then tells us in this passage that this is the fulfillment of another prophecy. Uh, from Psalm 34:20. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And then he also quotes another passage from Zechariah 12, verse 10. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. If you remember, the Passover lamb was not to have any broken bones. And so as the Passover lamb, as our Passover, it was important for Jesus not to have any bones broken in this, in this process. And that's another amazing thing. After all of the brutality carried out against the Lord that he had not a single bone broken in all of this is absolutely amazing and truly miraculous. It's, it's another fulfillment of this prophecy. So we pick up now with Luke 23, verse 50. So Luke 23, verses 50 through 56 is the next passage. And a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their plan and action. A man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed, and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, and on the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. Matthew and Mark both tell us that it is now evening, and Joseph of Arimathea comes forward. According to the parallel accounts, Joseph is a rich man. We learn that. Uh, we also learn that he is a prominent member of the council, so not just any member, he is a prominent leading member of the council, the Sanhedrin. We also know from the other accounts all combined together, he is a good and righteous man, that he had not consented to the plan and action of the Sanhedrin. So either he was there and objected or did not give in to this, or he was not there. There's another passage, I think, that tends to indicate that it was unanimous. So there's a good chance that Joseph was not there. There's a good chance that perhaps knowing something about this man, that he wasn't on their side, that uh, he was not invited to this particular meeting. That's one way that this could have gone down. Um, we also find that he is waiting for the kingdom of God. Uh, he was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews. And so he tried to keep this quiet. And of course, if he touches the body, this makes him unclean. But this is, a, this is a bold move. Not only does it risk him becoming unclean, but as he comes forward asking Pilate for the body, this puts him out in the open as a disciple, doesn't it? And it puts him in the crosshairs of these evil men who just crucified the Lord. He, this puts him on the Lord's side. Uh, John tells us that Joseph is accompanied by Nicodemus and points out this is the same guy who came to Jesus by night back in John chapter 3. And between the two men, they bring a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. That, that is a lot of myrrh and aloe, isn't it? I mean, between two men to carry the body of Jesus plus up to or close to 100 pounds of spices, that is, uh, that's a huge deal. So there's a lot going on here. This is uh, certainly a financial sacrifice. Certainly it is a uh, social, political sacrifice putting themselves out there in the open like this. Well, Pilate grants his request, and Joseph and Nicodemus are allowed to take the Lord's body down from the cross. They wrap up the body in linen cloth, according to Jewish custom, and they laid the body in a garden tomb, which had been chiseled out of the rock, a tomb in which no one had ever yet been laid. Uh, remember, Jewish custom at that time was to put a body in a tomb for one year. And at the end of that year, on the anniversary of the person's death, they would go in, they would collect the bones, 
they would put them in an ossuary, they were called, a stone box about the size of a Coleman cooler. So a couple feet by 18 inches, something like that, a little uh, cooler sized box. They would then put those bones after the flesh had decayed, put the bones in that box, the ossuary, and then they would put that box in a little uh, shelf in the tomb and the tomb was then ready for somebody else's body to come in there and lay for a while and decay for a while and so on so they could have a good number of bodies in each tomb but notice here this is a brand new tomb probably commissioned by Joseph of Arimathea for himself and so this is now his contribution to this effort as he allows Jesus to borrow his tomb for a few days if we want to put it optimistically like that uh, by the way, I've heard of people donating cemetery plots in modern times. Of course, sometimes we purchase a plot and then we move from the place where we thought we would be buried and uh, then we may donate that plot to a church. I've heard that happen a number of times where that is then given to somebody with no money for a proper burial. I've heard that uh, several times through the years. That's a very good thing to do and it seems perhaps in some way to go back to this. By the way, it's at least a bit interesting that the men who have been following Jesus uh, beginning from the beginning all the way up to this point, they run away on this day, right? The apostles, um, all of his other male followers, but two of his secret disciples are the men who make themselves public at this point. And then we'll get back to the women being the followers uh, consistently here also. Uh, John tells us that the tomb is nearby, so this is not a long trek. It's not a matter of them getting lost or getting the wrong one later as we come to the, re to the resurrection. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell us they roll a large stone against the entrance to the tomb. As I understand it, the idea is the stone was perhaps in something of a track, uh, so it could be rolled into place to seal the entrance and then rolled open to collect the bones, put them in the box, and then repeat that process with various family members who die through the years. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke now explain that the women are watching all of this. So getting back to the women here, they follow Jesus to Jerusalem. They follow Jesus throughout the trials overnight. They stand there all day watching the crucifixion. And now they are watching as Jesus is buried that evening. So they see the tomb. They see how and where the body is laid. And this is significant because of what happens later. They definitely do not show up at the wrong tomb on Sunday morning. That's one way that some people have tried to dismiss the resurrection. So that is not the case here if we believe these accounts. No, there are multiple women who all see the same thing together as a group. So very uh, minimal, just basically impossible chances for them to get the wrong place. And remember, again, Luke is emphasizing eyewitness accounts. So there's a, a good chance then that Luke has interviewed some of these women. They followed and saw, as the text says. And now Luke is relaying what they saw to us as his reader. So now, almost 2,000 years later, we have access to that eyewitness testimony. In verse 56, Luke tells us that uh, when the uh, women come back with even more spices and perfumes, they then rest on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. In the harmony of the Gospels, we find in Matthew 27, 61 through 66, that on the next day, on the Sabbath itself, as I understand the timing of this, the chief priests and the Pharisees come to Pilate. And they explain that while Jesus was alive, that deceiver, as they refer to Jesus, that deceiver said to his followers, after three days I am to rise again. And so the Jewish leaders then want Pilate to give special orders to make the grave extra secure until the third day so that the disciples do not come and steal the body and make the last deception worse than the first. How interesting there to guard the tomb, but only until the third day. Do you see what that means? If Jesus didn't rise until the fourth or the fifth day, the prophecy would not have been fulfilled. It would not have been a valid prophecy. Even with the resurrection, Jesus would have been a false prophet in a sense. And so they were very specific with this. They understood what the Lord has said. Pilate agrees to this uh, concern of theirs. He assigns a guard of soldiers to the task, uh, probably a group of 16 men and rotations for each at the different shifts throughout the day. He then tells them to go make it as secure as you know how. Uh, which they do by posting the guard and then setting a seal on the stone. I think of the song, Up from the Grave He Arose, and the line that says, Vainly they seal the dead, 
Remember that? Vainly they seal the dead. They're putting a seal on this tomb. But it means nothing when it comes to confining the Lord to that space. Vainly they seal the dead. That seal did nothing except prove that the body was not stolen. And it's also strange that the Jewish leaders seem to understand the Lord's prediction, but his own disciples seem to miss it completely. So these well-educated religious leaders were listening to what Jesus said. And they were paying attention and they knew the importance of that prophecy. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. So next week, let us pick up with Luke 24, verse 1. We'll come to the Lord's resurrection. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. Please be sure to sign up uh, online for worship this coming Lord's Day. Again, we'll have one service at 9 a.m. And then if needed, we will replay that service on the projector at 1030. Uh, remember, we plan on having Aaron close tonight's class with a prayer. And so at this time, let's all go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you today for all of our many blessings, everything that you do for us, everything you give to us, allowing us to come together, whether it's remote or via video or in person. We appreciate the fact that you're allowing us to still be together and do everything that we're doing. Bless us all. Look out for all of us. Look out for our leaders. And thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray.